Hello, my name is Jeff Hunt, and this is part six of my mini series on the science of water. If you're enjoying the series, then uh, please, if you'd like to uh, like and subscribe to the YouTube channel, that would help me greatly. Uh, Apologise for the slightly quirky nature in which this has been produced, but I'm uh, I'm improving every day, I hope. Anyway, this series is really a quick guide for surveyors on the theory of how water can do what it does, because I feel it's important to understand the science behind what we take a look at so that we can advise our clients uh, accordingly. So we've looked at the behavior of molecules during evaporation and condensation. So now I'm going to take a closer look at the switch between the two, and that is called the dew point. So let's start by looking at this beautiful lake on a cold morning with the mist rising above it. What you see is a cold lake with a cold air above it warming in the early morning sun. Now, as the air warms, the molecules in the lake start to, well, evaporate, turning from a liquid to a gas. But here's the interesting bit. At the same time on this cold morning, molecules in the air will condense back into the lake. Now, this is because the lake stays colder as the air warms. Now, what I want you to imagine is a point where the number of water molecules evaporating from the lake is the same as the number of molecules condensing back. So there's a sort of nothing happening. The cycle is equal, condensing and evaporation. So this is key to understanding what the dew point actually is. Now let's take time here to remember that in practice, molecules travel at different speeds at the same temperature. Now, this is the tricky thing about science because sometimes we have to assume everything is static to be able to see what happens. So for example, this lake that I've shown you, it's a picture of a lake. It's not a video and it's not actually what would really um, happen because let's face it, in reality, nothing is static. So this is why as surveyors, we have to be very careful with how science is presented to us because it might not reflect what's happening on site, but more of that later. So in this scenario, the same amount of molecules is going in as going out. Now let's heat the air up some more and with it a little bit of the lake and let's think about what happens. So we know that by adding energy, this will allow more water molecules to escape the lake as a gas. Therefore, the rate of exchange will become in favor of evaporation. The air gets more water molecules and these are keen to absorb the energy in the warm air and move around more rapidly. So in some sense the air is holding more vapour and as the air is now holding more than it did before it is said to have a higher pressure and this is called the vapour pressure. So air gets more water vapor because the energy in it means more water wants to be a gas than it wants to be a liquid. And then let's imagine that we heat the air above the lake even more so that it fills up with even more molecules. So imagine the air is like a sponge absorbing water and like a sponge full of water, it doesn't take much of a squeeze to get any of that water to come out. We can squeeze air by cooling it, thereby taking the energy out. Now we have a situation where we tilt towards condensation as being the predominant preference. But we don't need to go back to the original temperature of the lake to get the water to turn back into a liquid. Just as you don't need to squeeze a sponge very hard if it's full of water. You don't need to reduce the temperature of saturated air by very much in order to get it to condense. If the point where the moisture condenses is called the dew point, the dew point temperature goes up as the air receives more water molecules. This is why the dew point varies and why it can be calculated if you know the vapour pressure and the current temperature of the air. Now don't forget that this is a constantly moving target as the air warms and cools. 
Now, the reason we need to know this is because one degree above the dew point and the evaporation rate is higher and one degree below the condensation rate is higher. This is very important to understand when you consider such issues as condensation, ventilation and movement of moisture through spray foams in roofs, for example. If vapour meets the dew point as it travels through a material, it will turn to water and that is precisely what we don't want. You can see in this diagram that as the temperature moves away from the dew point, the evaporation or the condensation will increase. There are two ways to think about the amount of moisture in the air, the dew point and the relative humidity. Dew point tells us the amount of moisture in the air. Relative humidity is the percentage of the moisture in the air. When thinking about the dangers of condensation, knowing the dew point is probably more useful because the same relative humidity value can occur at a variety of different temperatures, as you can see in this diagram. A high RH does not mean you will get condensation. So let's recap a little bit here. As you add more grams of water into the air by heating it, the less you need to cool the air back down before it saturates. And this is what pushes the dew point temperature up. Problems with the theory and practice in construction. Well, firstly, everything I've said so far assumes that everything happens at the same pressure. Change the pressure and water behaves quite differently. If you move to a higher climate, the weight of the air becomes less, and that means water molecules can move more readily. So you can see that if I set my model to a standard in say Nepal, that has the lowest air pressure, this won't work in Jordan, which has the highest pressure. This means we have to be very careful of other countries' models and standards. Secondly, the dew point calculation models are based exclusively on what's called moisture diffusion theory. And this is moisture molecules moving through building materials. But the problem is in reality, air leaks in and out of walls and cavities rather than moisture diffusion. And it accounts for the large proportion of moisture transmission in buildings. Because of the variations in workmanship, construction details, the use of sealants or corks and similar variables, the relative contributions of diffusion and air leakage in walls and ceilings is very unpredictable. Thirdly, condensation models assume that the environmental conditions, the temperature, the moisture, the wind, air pressure are unchanging, that they are constant or frozen. But actually conditions constantly change inside and outside of the buildings. Cold spots occur around windows and doors where lapses or emissions of insulation have occurred and at thermal short circuits such as lintels, cold bridging. These are all places where problematic condensation is likely to occur in isolation. Also, the prediction of wall condensation does not necessarily indicate that it actually is going to be a problem. The length and severity of winter and the ability of the building materials to safely store and later expel moisture are important factors in determining whether a condensation problem will actually occur. So here are some examples. Uh, there's a picture here you can see of thermal image on an alcove in a shower cubicle. And you can see this huge blue cold spot. And that's because that this is an outside wall and the alcove is actually built into the thickness. Also, the prediction of building and wall condensation does not necessarily indicate an actual condensation problem. Conversely, predicting that condensation won't occur in principle when additional materials are added, such as spray foams, can be equally misleading. As I've said before, the length and severity of winter and the ability of materials to safely store and later expel the moisture are important factors of saying to you where uh, moisture will actually occur. And with this in mind, the best defence against building moisture damage is a good offence. Building in proper air and vapour barriers, realistic ventilation 
and thermally broken door, lintel and window components. I hope you've enjoyed the series so far. Uh, other chapters are available on the YouTube channel. So if you've liked the series, please do like and subscribe, as I say. Um, there are other videos about how we apply these theories in practice. So please do look them up as well.